Recently, a report leaked out claiming as of 2023, there still is over 1 million people logging into the PlayStation 3 daily. This is pretty crazy to think about considering this console is turning 18 years old this year. Majority of people playing the PS Triple in 2024 stick to titles like Call of Duty and Battlefield. But what about the more obscure titles? Games that time forgot about or used to thrive at one point or another? In this video, I decided to go explore and find these communities to share my experience both in-game as well as what each multiplayer mode had to offer. This is Exploring Dead PlayStation 3 Games. Before we begin, I'd like to give a big shout out to the following Discord members and fellow content creators for the assistance on this video. From the PlayStation 3 online Discord channel, Fallen underscore Blade, Alex, who flung dung 93, PSX Maniac, and fellow YouTubers, to Zappel Tomorrow Man, Dorian underscore D, and Lag HD. Thank you guys so much for helping, it's greatly appreciated. I want to take you back to 2008. Maybe you were watching Tropic Thunder in the theaters, calling attack dogs in Call of Duty World at War, or if you owned a PlayStation 3 at the time, you might have been eagerly anticipating one of the biggest titles on the platform, that being Metal Gear Solid 4. Included with MGS4 was a separate multiplayer experience known as Metal Gear Online. It had a relatively short shelf life, being online for only four years with the server shutting down in June of 2012. However, thanks to the great work of the team Save MGO, it's been fully restored and now supports crossplay with both the PC as well as the PlayStation 3. I've covered MGO in a previous video, but I never had the chance to fully play it, so let's check it out. After signing my life away, I created my character and hopped online. The first server I jumped into was called Low Level Lobby, which uh, seems pretty applicable in my case. We play on this mode called Sneaking Mission, where one player is Solid Snake and you're tasked with either either defending or taking him down. Snake is equipped with the Octo Camo, which allows him to blend into the environment to his advantage. This makes it significantly harder to find him in the world and caught me off guard a few times as well. In one example, I found a ladder leading to a rooftop. Naturally, I was curious and climbed it. After coming to what looked like a dead end, I turned around and instantly got stunned as Snake appeared out of nowhere. This just goes to show how well this feature works and reinforces sticking to groups then venturing on your own. Also, apparently you can kill people in this game by stabbing them in the ass cheek. After getting my butt cheeks collapsed, I quickly realized that MGO has a steep learning curve to it. It's been at least a decade since I last played this game, and it really shows. The gameplay is slow and tactical, but you do have a wide range of weapons and equipment that you can use to make up for it. Weapons in this game have their own sense of weight, with each one operating slightly different than the other. Take for instance the M4. In most use cases, it's great at taking someone down, but has a side effect of having a ton of recoil to deal with. Not knowing how to manage this will get you killed, so it only reinforces the importance of taking time to learn how each gun works. This only adds to the steep learning curve of Metal Gear Online, as new players might find this game quite challenging to fully grasp. It's definitely not a game where you can turn off your brain and half-ass it, as you'll easily get destroyed. <laughs> Also, this game is just really goofy. In typical MGS fashion, you can hide inside a cardboard box or roll around in an oil barrel that sends people flying. You can also place wank magazines across the map, which causes a player to become distracted and disables them for a good 20 seconds. <laughs> Anyways, the next mode we played on was this objective based mode where you had to capture bases in a similar fashion to if you were played Domination in Call of Duty. I found this mode to be the most approachable for new players, as getting killed isn't nearly as important than capturing and holding bases is. We also played on what I believe is a new map provided by the Save MGO community. Speaking of which, this revival project has brought back scrap maps originally intended for Metal Gear Online. This also works on the PC as well as the PlayStation 3. Pretty cool if you ask me. I somewhat did better this Round, but I still had a lot of room for improvement. After this match ended, I hopped into a different server, hoping to have better luck and not get killed every 10 seconds. We played on this level called Hazard House, set in a giant mansion. Out of all the maps I played on, I think this one was my favorite. I love how the rooms have a great amount of detail to them, and the art style seems to be a bit more colorful than the other levels I previously played on. You also have a lot of options in terms of how you want to approach the map, as there's various ladders you can climb, windows to jump through, as well as rooms that are connected to each other. Now, I didn't do any better than my previous round, but at least I enjoy exploring the map. 
The last mode I played on was called Stealth Deathmatch. This is a free-for-all round-based mode that plays how you would expect a battle royale game would. You spawn with a weapon and only one life, while the game forces you into the center of the map. This mode is more tailored to seasoned vets of MGO as it relies heavily on stealth and playing tactically, so newcomers might find this hard to grasp and might be an open target for a lot of players. Overall, it's a serviceable mode and I wish more battle royale games took this approach. Despite being kicked or having people try to kick me, the community was really friendly and made me feel welcomed. There are so many cases of others being accommodating and understanding of my skill level. Even in lobbies where there wasn't much going on, the sense of camaraderie among each other was quite evident. There was times in this game where the enemy clearly had the upper hand, but instead of attacking me, they would stop and just salute me or even walk away. I never experienced something like this in a PvP game before, and it truly made it special. If you're new to the game like I was, there's tons of guides online created for new players and returning ones too. Definitely check these out if you want to revisit this game. Overall, my time with Save MGO was quite enjoyable. It's a game that will beat you down initially, but over time, you'll find yourself getting better and eventually grasping on why people still play this 16 years later. The next game I wanted to try was Call of Duty 3, easily one of the most forgotten about games in the series. The PlayStation 3 community surrounding this game is very small. Sometimes during the week you can find the odd person here or there, but most of the time it's a ghost town. Most players nowadays exist inside the Call of Duty 3 PlayStation 3 Discord channel, so I joined it and participated in a few community events that they were hosting. The first match I joined was on the map called Elder Dam. We were playing on this game mode called War, which if you've never played before, basically there's these capture points across the map in which each team has to fight for, with a team who captures all of them winning the game. This is a really fun mode as it forces people to actually play the objective rather than just camping half the time. The first thing you notice when playing Call of Duty 3 is just how different this game is compared to the rest of the series. You don't have loadouts in this game, instead you have classes to choose from. Each class has their own assigned weapon as well as ability. For an example, the Scout class is assigned with either a Springfield Rifle or a Scope Car 98, with the ability over time to call in airstrikes. The meta class, on the other hand, not only has their own shotgun and smoke grenade, but can also revive fallen teammates, while the support class is either given an MG42 that not only is beneficial in offensive or defensive positions, but you can also supply ammo to others. One thing that Call of Duty 3 does differently is its level progression system. Instead of having a universal rank that you earn via XP for matches played, Call of Duty 3 instead resets your rank every time you join a match. You start out as a private and you can work your way up to a sergeant in game by completing things Things like objectives, assisting your team, or getting kills. It does give you some additional benefits, such as extra grenades and whatnot, but that's about it. Out of all the maps in Call of Duty 3, Elder Dam's probably the best one. It's small in size, but wide enough to accommodate all playstyles. My only real complaint is that vehicles do not have much room to maneuver within Elder Dam. A lot of the time, I found myself getting stuck or caught in the environment since the roads are quite narrow. So how did the match on Elder Dam go? When I joined the game, I was on the Axis side with our team leading the match. Our team was pressing the allies pretty hard, capturing points and nailing some kills in the process. Near the halfway mark, I noticed we only need one more flag to win the game. Seeing the opportunity, I ran straight for it. For most of the game, it wasn't very eventful until the final three minutes rolled around. This time, we were at significant risk of losing the game, as we only had two capture points left. After shooting a dude in the dick, I came across my teammate, Rue Track 12 dunking his nuts on the enemy team in a very 2000s fashion, which was instantly met with karma moments later. Despite the odds against us, we held our own to the final minute and ended up winning the game. The next map we played on was called Murville. Murville is a medium sized map that takes place mostly outdoors. It's set between a destroyed structure that acts as a main choke point of the level, as well as having an underground tunnel that runs underneath the entire map. During the match, I watched my teammate maul over an enemy with his jeep, in which out of nowhere a tank rolled in and sent so underscore sandwich flying. Realizing I only had a grenade, I attempted to take the tank out. Nope. After butchering that, I ran in cover in hopes he'd just forget I existed, and to my surprise, he did and just casually drove off as if nothing happened. This match was really janky as I've forgotten how wacky this game's ragdolls are. 
That being said, Merville is a fun map with a big party, but outside of that, it's alright. The next server I joined had myself and another player going by the name Jesus is Real. This time, I played on a map called Poisson. We spent the majority of the match running around aimlessly back and forth, capturing the odd flag here and there, and rolling around the level in a tank. Eventually, I got bored and we proceeded to kill each other. The fuck? Poisson is one of the better maps in Call of Duty 3. It's perfect for any player lobby size, can accommodate most playstyles, and if you get bored, there's plenty of fully explorable buildings to check out. Afterwards, I decided to host my own server on a random Tuesday night, in the off chance that people would still be playing. And to my surprise, within 10 minutes of hosting, I came across two random players. We played on a few maps, but I'll highlight the ones that were the most interesting. The first one we played on was called Argentin. Set across various bunkers and trenches, this is a medium sized map that benefits mostly mid to long range classes. There's a lot of foliage on this map, which gives you the opportunity not only to blend into the environment, but encourages you to approach it in a stealthier manner. At one point, I decided to dick around in a buggy. The fuck? After I gave my buggy jacked, I decided to go after it. Anyways, Argentine is a great map for most player party sizes. My only real complaint here is the performance, as the frame rate tends to tank depending on what part of the level that you're facing. Afterwards, we played on a map called Les Hommes. Apologies if I butchered that. Set inside a French village, this map appears to be a lot larger than it actually is. Most of the battles take place in the town center here, with various roads and corridors to flank from. You also have a connecting road that goes around the map too, as well as being surrounded by a minefield. Personally, I thought this was enjoyable and refreshing to play on. Some might find that this map encourages camping to a degree, or the layout tad confusing, but that mostly comes down to personal preference. Call of Duty 3 might not have been the most innovative game in the series, but anyone who still plays it today will tell you how great this game truly still is. If you prefer a slower paced first person shooter that's easy to pick up and play, then Call of Duty 3 is for you. The next game up was Red Faction Guerrilla. When I started to do research on dead PlayStation 3 games, I tried to find the most obscure titles possible. Red Faction Guerrilla seemed to be one of them, so I gave it a try. Now I tried matchmaking a few times and didn't get anywhere with it. Red Faction's multiplayer also requires you to have six players to start a match, a task that uh, is not very tangible nowadays. I decided to team up with my friend Fallen underscore Blade from the PlayStation 3 online discord to get into a custom match. Since it was just myself and Blade playing, we opted to do deathmatch the entire time. The first map we played on was called Quarantine, set between two bases surrounded by a giant minefield. After smacking Blade with my sledgehammer, I decided to take full advantage of the destruction that this game has. Basically, any structure you come across can be destroyed or manipulated with. Each building is made up of various materials, so something like concrete is generally easier to destroy, whereas metal will take a few swings before it falls apart. On top of this, the destruction has various layers of physics behind it, which accounts for things like force, weight of materials, what direction you're hitting at, etc. You also have power-ups on each level. These not only can alter or destroy the environment, rather be used as a weapon to other players. One of my personal favorites was one called Thrust, which basically shot you in the air making a straight path into whatever you're standing under. You also had Rhino, which basically juggernauts you into any obstacle in your way. Near the end of the match, we caused so much destruction that it was no longer recognizable than what it originally looked like when we started the game. Next match had us playing on a level called Crash Site. This one was larger and made up of radio towers and bunkers. This round, I discovered these things called remote satchels. It basically works like C4 and you can set up to four at a time, which can level buildings if you place them in the right spots. I also found another power up in this map called Firepower, which makes your sledgehammer explode anything on impact. Neat. Halfway through the match, Blade and I stopped shooting at each other and just stuck to destroying shit instead. This mechanic is done so well that honestly, I think they would have been better off making this game into a PvE style of experience over PvP. While on the topic of PvP, it's actually quite fun in this game. It functions quite like any other third person shooter you've played before without doing anything bold or different, which isn't a bad thing, don't get me wrong, as it really doesn't need to. 
Weapons, on the other hand, have a good amount of variety to them. You have your standard pistol, rifle, shotgun, but you also have unique guns like a launcher that shoots saw blades at people. My favorite gun out of this game has to be the nano rifle, which decimates any object it comes across with, as well as people. If you haven't guessed already, I really enjoyed my time with this game. Honestly, I don't know man, there's something truly great about this game that I can't describe in words. Considering they somehow got the Geomod physics engine to not only work in multiplayer, but without any noticeable compromises, deserves a lot of respect. You can still find this game quite easily in the used market, so it's definitely worth checking out if you come across it. Afterwards, me and Fallen decide to hop into another obscure PlayStation 3 game, which happens to be Lost Planet Extreme Conditions. Now, I vividly remember playing the Xbox 360 online demo for Lost Planet way back in the day, so I thought this would be a great trip down memory lane again. According to Fallen, a lot of the PlayStation 3 players have moved over to the 360 version nowadays, as it supports crossplay with the PC. You can still find people playing this game on the PlayStation 3, but it's just a much smaller population. Hoping we could find others and wanting to revisit this game again, we both jumped into a lobby and played a few rounds of elimination. The first map we were on was called Pirate's Fortress. This is the map from the demo I spent so much time in my youth playing, so it was quite nostalgic. Now, admittedly, I haven't played this game in years, so going back to it, I thought I'd do okay. Blade had actually asked me beforehand on a scale of 1 to 10 on how I would rate myself. Confidently, I said 5, as I thought I was decent in the past. It was at this moment that he knew. He fucked up. Anyways, the combat in Lost Planet Extreme Conditions plays far different than most games in its genre. There's no options to look down your sights or adjust your camera view. Rather, you use the reticle on your screen as a reference to where you're shooting at. This works fine in close quarters combat, but becomes trickier when you have long range battles. I do feel the hit detection can be a tad off at times, or it could simply be latency related too. It's kinda hard to tell. Lost Planet's main gameplay mechanic is the ability to grapple onto surfaces using a hook. This can be used to climb structures, zip line down buildings, or be a lifesaver in combat. The hook is a nice addition to Lost Planet's gameplay, as your character moves kind of slow and it helps alleviate that to a degree. And it's just really fun to use. Another aspect of Lost Planet's multiplayer is the ability to capture these things called data posts. Every time you capture one, you're given energy in which you can operate machinery like mechs or weapons like the plasma rifle. In addition, every post that you capture also highlights where enemies are on the mini-map, which is a nice bonus. One caveat to capturing data posts is that it keeps you fully vulnerable. This happened to me, which instead of retaliating, I blew myself up instead. Anyways, Pirate's Fortress is an enjoyable map that works well with most party sizes. I found the addition of mechs in particular to be really cool. My favorite being the one that shoots out endless amounts of missiles. One weird thing to note here is just how bright this map is. I can't recall if it's always been like this, or it's just a PlayStation 3 port, but god damn. Afterwards, we played on a map called Battlegrounds. Battlegrounds has two parts to it, a ground level that's set in the streets made up of man-made trenches and pounds of snow, while the other part is set on an old structure attached to a connecting bridge. It feels like this map is more ideal for bigger player counts, as I found it too big for a party size. Blade mentioned that this map is a lot better with full lobbies, so I'll take his word for it. I will say I do love the art style in this map. The snow mixed in with the old European style buildings really makes it stand out. Lastly, we tried out radar base. Unfortunately, my PlayStation 3 Bruh. froze mid-game, so I don't really have much to say about the match as I wasn't really there for it. So instead, I'm going to talk about Radar Base. As the name implies, the level is wide and resembles more of an arena than it does a base I find. Radar Base does have a good amount of verticality to it as well as things to climb. It definitely felt more open compared to previous levels as it wasn't surrounded by bunkers or buildings and provided more opportunities for me to use my hook. While we're on the topic of hooks, whenever you respawn, you start on a ledge overlooking the base. You can jump down of course, or you can also repel down, which I thought was pretty cool. I found compared to Pirate's Fortress and Battlegrounds, Radar Base looks kind of bland. I think this mostly comes down to the lack of snow in this level, as that's kind of a trademark to the series. The snow effects, as well as explosions, are really well done and still hold up even to this day. I wish more games would embrace the whole snow aesthetic. Back on topic, Radar Base seemed like a good map to play with a bunch of people ideally. Speaking of which, if you're new to Extreme Conditions, I recommend finding others via the place PlayStation 3 online discord or the Lost Planet discord to set up a private match giving you time to fully understand on how this game works.
revisiting Lost Planet Extreme Conditions was more of a trip down memory lane for me, if anything. It's pretty much exactly how I remembered it back in 2007, and I'm glad I had the chance to revisit it again. The next game to try was Fear 1. Released originally on the PC back in 2005, the original Fear left a big impact in both its unique style and groundbreaking AI. Although the single player campaign is definitely the highlight of Fear, it also had an underrated multiplayer mode that's still being played daily, at least on the PC. So what about the PlayStation 3 port of this game? Do people still play it? I wanted to find out, so I hopped online and went searching. Now, I've been trying to find people playing this game for the past year, and despite my best efforts, it seems that fear on the PS Triple is a ghost town in 2024. Not wanting to call quits on this one, I hopped onto the PlayStation 3 online Discord and asked around on a Saturday afternoon. And within 40 minutes, we had at least three players in lobby ready to go. After selecting my gun and character model, we hopped into the first map, which was called Campus. This was set in a corporate office building with an outdoor courtyard set in the middle of the map. During our time on campus, we played on Deathmatch, which seemed to work well with this sort of map. Its layout isn't too small to be a complete sweat fest, and it doesn't take forever to find someone. One of the first things you'll notice in Fear is the ambiance. This game is a first person psychological horror shooter after all, but even in its multiplayer, you still have that style and feeling that the single player nailed so well. One of Fear's best aspects in multiplayer is just how well the combat meshes in an online setting. Whenever you get in gunfights, you leave a trail of destruction made up of bullet holes in the environment, as well as this really cool smoke effect. This also extends if you lug a grenade down a hallway, as both the furniture in the game's world and lighting will react naturally to it. The guns also have a good amount of variety to them with their own abilities. One of my favorites being the 10mm HV Penetrator, which is basically a high-tech nail gun that can be used to pen people to surfaces or you had the shotgun that basically destroyed anything in its path. I also figured out you could perform a flying kick in this game, which is really satisfying. Overall, Campus was a fun map, but I was ready to move on to the next one. The next level we played on was called Hotel. This map is a lot smaller than the other ones and had its own distinct playstyle to it. I found myself more motivated to run and gun on here since the pace was a lot faster. We also played on a different game mode this time around called Slow Mo Deathmatch, which basically is a variation of Deathmatch, but with a twist. Across the map, there's these things called recharge packs, and when you pick up one, it'll regenerate over time. Once it's fully regenerated, you can activate bullet time, aka slow mo, which forces everyone in the game to go into slow motion. I think the implementation here is great, but seems to be more gimmicky if anything else. Trying to maneuver around this map and then all of a sudden slowing down at a moment's notice can be more annoying than cool, as it affects both the flow and momentum that you've already built up. Another 2000s shooter that incorporated this mechanic was Time Shift, which instead of forcing the entire lobby into slow motion, the game opted to use this giant bubble, where only those inside the bubble were affected, not the entire game. Hotel is more ideal if you want to do a 1v1 in, but outside of that, it's an alright map I guess. I just found it hard to see half the time, even with a flashlight on. The next map we tried was called Office. Unlike Hotel, which felt linear most of the time, Office gives you more space and opportunities to flank your opponents. I think Office ended up being my favorite map. It's easy to pick up and learn, but also challenging if you don't know where the main choke points are. You can play it aggressively, or you can opt to use the shadows to your advantage and flank people that way too. It's a map that highlights the best aspects of Fear's multiplayer and perfect for newcomers. Despite how positive my experience was with this game, there is a few design decisions that are mind boggling. During my play session, Fallen underscore Blade pointed out a big oversight in PvP. You see, whenever you die in this game, you have the option to respawn instantly or spectate. If you decide to spectate, this feature also lets you follow and see where your opponents are on the map. This is a pretty big deal in a competitive PvP game, and there's no option to turn it off. Another really odd design choice is changing your loadout in this game. Most first person shooters have it inside the pause menu, making it quick and easy to access. Fear, on the other hand, decided to hide this option. In order to change your loadout, out in this game, you have to navigate to the options menu, then scroll all the way down to the multiplayer options, and from there you can change your loadout. Why they didn't just assign this to a button or add to the pause menu in the first place is beyond me. 
If you decide to give Fears multiplayer a try, make sure you use the quick join feature as both the in-game server browser as well as game invites are broken. If you do try to use them, it'll give you a connection error and not let you connect to anyone else's lobby. In order to fix this, you need to back out to the XMB, then restart the game. Regardless, Fear still holds up incredibly well for a game that came out almost two decades ago. Sure, the PlayStation 3 port is um, not very good, but the core gameplay experience is still intact. Now, there's a few other PlayStation 3 games that I had tried when making this video that didn't make the final cut. I'd like to do a sequel to exploring dead PlayStation 3 games in the future covering those titles. The fuck? That being said, if you know of any obscure PlayStation 3 game still being played online, please let me know in the comments down below. Also, special thanks to 2Zip Hell Tomorrow Man, as not only did he suggest a few games for me to try, but also help with the creation of this video. If you like PlayStation 3 content, he uploads raw gameplay videos of forgotten PlayStation 3 games quite often. I'll leave a link to his channel in the description. That being said, if you've made it this far in this video, I just want to say thank you so much for watching. This one was quite the undertaking, and it took a lot more effort than I originally thought. If you enjoy this style of content, please consider leaving a like or even a subscription. It means a lot. And as always, until next time fellas, peace.